All right, welcome you guys to 1.2 part one. So in this section, we're gonna be talking about what a function is in detail and function notation, okay? Um, we're gonna be moving away from, slowly but surely moving away from using y instead of using y f of x, and we'll talk about that. So let's talk about what a function is. So it says here, a function is a correspondence between a first set called the domain and a second set called the range, such that each member of the domain corresponds to exactly one member of the range. So we're gonna look at a few different ways to look at this. We'll do some mapping diagrams, we'll do some ordered pairs, we'll do a graph, okay? So here's a mapping diagram, okay? So when we're looking at a mapping diagram, we wanna make sure every X value or every element of the domain goes with exactly one element of the range. So you can see here negative six is only going to one uh, value in the range, so that's good. Positive six only has one arrow coming out of it, so that's good. Same thing for negative three, three, and zero. This looks good since every element of the domain maps to exactly one element of the range. So we're going to go ahead and say that this is a function. Oops. This is a function since every element of the domain maps to exactly one, I can type, I promise, exactly uh, one element of the range, okay? Now, the fact that this 36 has two arrows going to it, it doesn't matter. We didn't say every element of the range can only go with one element of the domain. So we're really looking at this one way, okay? We wanna make sure that the ones on the left only have one arrow coming out of them. It's okay that two arrows go to 36. It's okay that two arrows go to nine, at least if we're looking at functions. All right, let's take a look at this one. So this correspondence here was mapping diagram. It shows George Bush only picked one Supreme Court justice, right? Uh, Clarence Thomas, but Bill Clinton picked two. George W. Bush picked two, and Barack Obama picked two. So on this one, we're gonna to have to say that this is not a function. Okay, so this is not a function. Oops. This is not a function since there are elements of the domain that have two arrows coming out of them. Okay. Uh, let's see here. Bill Clinton, George W. Bush, and Barack Obama uh, picked two Supreme Court justices. All right, and let's just highlight, you know, what the problems are, okay? So the problems are going to be uh, this one, this one, and that one, okay? All right, now we're looking at it uh, through ordered pairs instead of through a mapping diagram. So I can see right here that 9 is going with negative 5. It's corresponding with negative 5, and 9 is also... Uh, corresponding with positive five. So we're going to say this isn't a function. This isn't a function since the x value. Oops, sorry, you guys. I'm in this text box and it doesn't have the normal functions. Okay. Oh, I pick italics over here. Got it. Okay. Since the x value of 9 maps to two different y values. OK. All right, when we look over here, negative 5 is only going with 3, 0 is only going with 3, and 6 is only going with 3. So this one is good to go. This is a function. since every element of the domain corresponds to exactly 
one element of the range. Okay. So hopefully for these two scenarios, given a mapping diagram or given a list of ordered pairs, you can tell whether or not it's a function. So if we have a graph, we use the vertical line test to be able to see if we are looking at a function or not. So let's just kind of talk about why we use the vertical line test, okay? So let's say that I have um, the following graph, x equals the absolute value of y, okay? And let's get some actual points here. I'm gonna take this a tiny bit more that way, there we go. So we'll say this is two and this is three. Oh boy, I think I'm gonna have to rotate it more, you guys, to make it match the other one. All right, close enough, I guess. Okay, so the reason why we draw a vertical line to check, right? So I'm gonna draw a vertical line and a vertical line is gonna to touch twice. Well, the reason why a vertical line works because if you think about it, these ordered pairs, this one's two, three, and this one is two, negative three. So if you go back to that previous example, right? The, this example right here, okay? Nine showed up twice as an X value, right? Nine went with negative five and nine went with five. Well, we have that same situation here. Two is going with three and two is going with negative three. So drawing a vertical line will reveal an X value that's going with two different Y values. All right, so if we draw a vertical line anywhere, we're only gonna touch one time, one time, right? And so because of that, this one is a function. Okay. But over here, we can see a vertical line touches three times. So this is not a function. We can put down um, a vertical line touched more than once. Okay. All right. Go over here, same thing, not a function for the same reasons, right? It ended up touching twice. It touched here and it touched there. So not a function. Same thing here, touched twice, right? So this one is also not a function. On this one here, no matter where we draw it, it looks like a vertical line is just going to touch one time, you know, no matter where we draw it. So this is a function. And this one's tricky. So let's go to the tricky spot. The tricky spot's really right here. Okay. So it is a function because technically that line only touched once. It touches here. But it does not touch here because there's no point there. There's an open circle, which means that there is no graph there. Okay, so we're good. We really only touched once, okay? So it is a function since one of the circles is opened, is open. If it had been closed, right, we close this up, then that would be a no because we would technically be touching twice, okay? All right. Sorry, my writing's really bad. Hopefully you can read that. Okay. So now we're gonna talk about no the, the notation for functions and the importance of it, okay? Um, so we're gonna be replacing y with f of x, these are the same thing. So like in the past, you might've had like y equals x squared. Well, in the future, you might see that we just write f of x equals x squared, okay? Um, and that's, it's a better notation. You can see right here in the second paragraph, the beginning of it, why it's in a better notation. Instead of writing when x equals negative two, the value of y is 10, 
we can simply write f of negative two is 10. So like for an example, like let's say it's this one right here, okay? If I were to plug in um, a one, right? In y equals one squared, we get one. And then if I plug in a two, we get four. And so here it's y equals one, it's y equals four. So when I see this one and this four, I've lost what the X value was that goes along with it. But over here, if, if I use this other notation and I say, okay, F of one equals one squared, F of two equals uh, two squared, and you get your one and you get your four, right? Okay, over here, when I just write Y equals one and Y equals four, I can't tell what the X value was, but over here, when I have like F of one is one, f of two is four. It's much clearer like, oh, okay, I got one when I plugged in one. Oh, I got four when I plugged in two, okay? And you can see that we're gonna, often we call functions f, g, and h in this class, but it says here, as you progress, you'll see some other names for functions. And these, these letters actually tell us like, this is my profit function. This is the velocity, this is the acceleration. So when we see something like V of two, it says a lot, it says that's the velocity at time two. So if I put like 10 you know, feet per second after it, it's like, oh, okay, I know exactly what this 10 was. This 10 was the velocity at time two versus if I just had Y equals 10 feet, I, I wouldn't know what the X value was, but I also wouldn't know what type of a function it was. I wouldn't know, oh, that's the velocity. So this is just really much more concise. It says a lot more um, and it says it efficiently, okay? So we're gonna try to like put in the F of X more often instead of the Y. And in the class, basically anytime you see F of X, you, you kind of wanna think of it as a Y or you can replace it with the Y. All right. So here we go, here's a function where instead of writing Y equals, right? We put F of X equals. A function f is given by f of x equals 2x squared minus x plus 3. Find each of the following. Okay, so this notation looks like multiplication. It really can be confusing because up until now, anytime we saw parentheses like this, that would mean f times 0. But this does not mean multiply. So I'm actually going to like write that in right here, that this does not mean multiply. In this case, parentheses do not mean multiply, okay? So that gets a few people, okay? So then what does it mean, right? Okay, so what this means is, remember this is f of x. So what they're doing is they're giving you the x value. So you're gonna substitute or plug in zero for all x's, okay? So the math for this, right? So what's f of zero? Well, we're gonna go up here to the function and anywhere where we see an x, we're gonna put a zero. So when you're doing this, you have to follow PEMDAS, right? The parentheses, exponents, multiplication and division from left to right, addition and subtraction from left to right. So I'm gonna do the exponents first. So zero times zero is zero. And then uh, I'm gonna go ahead and combine these two, why not? So that's gonna just get us three, positive three, because basically anytime you see a zero, you can just cross it off, right? Okay, so then two times zero is zero and zero plus three is three. So more of the story, you know, how can we get this fast? If you see something like this, you guys, I just cross off anything with the zeros in it and think, okay, it's just the positive three. So here is our answer. F of zero is three. That's actually the ordered pair, zero comma three. Because remember, F of X equals Y. So they're giving you the X value and they're giving you the Y value, okay? All right, so we know that this means to substitute in, right? Plug in negative seven for all x's. So then we get that f of negative seven equals uh, 
All right, so exponents first. So negative seven times negative seven is 49. And again, I might as well combine these. So negative seven plus three is negative four. And then two times 49 is 98. So it looks like we get that F of negative seven is 94. And if you wanna write the ordered pair there, the ordered pair is when X was negative seven, y ended up being 94, okay? So not too bad, you just have to know what this notation means. Doesn't mean multiply, it means plug in the number or plug in whatever's inside the parentheses. Right now, we're gonna be substituting in 5a for all x's. Feels really weird, sometimes you'll actually plug in some sort of x for the x, and that feels really weird. Like in calculus, you might plug in an x plus h in there, okay, and that definitely feels strange. Okay, so we're gonna put a 5a in for all x's. So again, we have to do a 5a times 5a, right? You got to do the exponents first, you guys. Okay, so 5a times 5a. Well, 5 times 5 is 25, and a times a is a squared. So 2 times the 25, because now we can do that, right, is going to be uh, 50. So we got 50a squared minus 5a plus 3. Now stop here. I always get some students that go too far with it. They're like, well, let me factor it and let me solve it, right? You can't solve it if it doesn't equal zero, okay? So I'm gonna put a little note here. Be careful, don't try to solve this. In general, you can't solve if it doesn't equal zero, okay? All right, and this one we're gonna substitute in an a minus four for all x's. Okay, so f of a minus four is gonna be, make sure you use parentheses here, I didn't on the others because they were a single term. I have to on this one because I have two terms. And that's important because the negative is going to distribute to the second one, changing its sign. Okay. All right. Now, remember, exponents come first. So I'm going to have two. But then I have a minus 4 times a minus 4. See, if you don't have those parentheses, you guys, you'd have the wrong sign on the four. So important that we have those. So let's do some of the dirty work off to the side here. So what I mean by that is we got to foil out a minus four, right? And there's formulas and stuff for this, um, but I find, I try to use the least amount of formulas possible because, you know, it's hard to memorize a lot of stuff. And these middle two always combine. So negative 4a and negative 4a make negative 8a. So that's what we're going to bring back into our problem for the a minus 4 times a minus 4. And we might as well combine this 4 and 3 to get us 7, right? It's a little bit less to write. OK, I'm going to distribute the 2. Everybody's going to be twice as big. We're just going to combine like terms here. Okay. So 2a squared. Well, you know what? Let me write this a little bit further over, you guys. 
That's my highest exponent. And then we're going to go ahead and combine the a's here, right? We've got a negative 16a minus 1a. That's going to get us negative 17a. And then we've got some co uh, constants here, like 32 plus 7, which is going to get us 39. And again, don't solve it. This is f of a minus 4, OK? Do not solve. This is actually a question on the final, I believe. OK, graphing using tables. All right. So they've already picked the x values for you. So you're just going to substitute them in, OK? So if negative 3 is my x, negative 2 is my x, negative 1, 0, 1 squared. I'll just do parentheses on all of these, you guys, just to be consistent. Uh, 2 squared minus 5. And 3 squared minus 5. OK. So negative 3 times negative 3. A negative times a negative is a positive. So it looks like we're going to get 4. Negative 2 times negative 2 is 4. So negative 1. Negative 1 times negative 1 is 1. So negative 4. 0 times 0 is 0. So negative 5. 1 times 1 is 1. 2 times 2 is 4. And 3 times 3 is 9. Now you'll notice we got some of the same um, values out, right? We got some repeats, and that's just because negative 3 squared and down here positive 3 squared, they're both going to get you 9s. So that's why we ended up getting the 4 twice, right? We got the 4 here and we got the 4 here. Same thing's true about all of these negatives. Negative 2 squared and positive 2 squared, they're both 4, so we got the same answer there. So we're going to get some symmetry. You're going to see in this problem, we're going to have some symmetry in it. OK, so we have to graph the ordered pairs, uh, negative 3, 4, negative 2, negative 1, negative 1, negative 4, 0, negative 5, 1, negative 4, 2, negative 1, and three positive four. So let's go graph these, okay? All right, negative three, four would be, so negative three, then up four. Negative two, negative one. Negative one, negative four. Zero, negative five. One, negative four. Where's that symmetry showing now? Two, negative one, and three, four. So we have symmetry about the y-axis here. Later on, you'll learn that the reason why we have symmetry about the y-axis here is because it's an even function. I kind of missed a dot. Let me just make that dot a little bigger. There we go. OK. All right. So now let's say you're graphing. You have to pick these x values, you guys. And I've told you before, if like you're graphing it, and it's not enough. You can't tell what it is. You know, you're like, dang it, I don't know what that is. Does it go like this? Does it turn around? Then just plug more x values in until you can see what it's going to do. OK, these first two, I kind of picked the x values for you. But um, well, the last one, we're going to pick them. OK. All right. So on this one, same thing. We're going to substitute in the negative 3. Negative 3 times negative 3 times negative 3 is negative 27. And we know that the, the minus a negative really means plus. So this is going to be negative 24. Now, is negative 24 on our graph paper? No. So we're not going to graph this. We're just going to say out of uh, the range, right? Or too big. How about that? No. We'll say not on graph. Mm 
Okay. All right. So we're going to substitute in, and this is more realistic, by the way, you guys, this is how you would probably do things. You'd be like, oh, dang, that one didn't work. Okay. Let me go smaller then. All right. So negative two times negative two times negative two is negative eight. Again, we know that minus a negative means plus. I guess six, A, hey, is negative two, negative six on the graph? Close enough, right? We'll say this is negative six right here, you guys. Okay, so we'll substitute in negative one. So negative one times negative one times negative one stays negative, but we're gonna get a plus one because of the minus a negative. So we're gonna get negative one comma zero as our ordered pair. All right, we're gonna substitute in zero. So zero cubed minus zero. Well, that's zero minus zero. So the origin is in the graph. All right, we'll substitute in one. One times one times one is one. Take away one is zero. Wow, lots of zeros here, huh? One zero. And then two cubed minus two. So two times two times two is eight. Take away two is six. So two sixes on the graph over two up six. So again, we'll just pretend six is right there, you guys. And then the last one to substitute in, three cubed minus three. So 27 minus three, oh my goodness, this is gonna be too big again. So we'll go ahead and say not on graph. Okay, so if we go in to graph this, it should look something like, like that, okay? And if you're using um, my math lab to do this, it pretty much graphs it for you as long as you have enough points, the amount of points it requests, okay? You'll just click the graph button and it'll, it'll graph it. All right, now on this one, I actually ask you guys to pick the X values. I said, can we pick any values for the inputs? Okay, so let's investigate that. If we were to pick like, let's say negative five, We substitute in negative five, we end up with a negative under the radical, which means we know that it's imaginary. And remember, this is the real number plane, right? There's only real numbers on here. We're not on the complex plane. Um, so there's no imaginaries here, okay? So we can't go picking stuff like negative five, negative six, negative seven. The smallest value we can pick Okay, the smallest value we can pick, I claim, would be negative four. Okay, so we'd have to pick negative four and up. Okay. So we don't want to go picking x values like negative five, negative six, et cetera, because those are going to give us imaginaries. So we can pick negative four, right? Okay, now I'm going to pick negative three. I'll pick negative two just to show you something, and then we'll talk, okay? So let's start there. All right. So if we substitute these in one at a time, I'm just going to do them in blue so it clashes with this up here, okay? So let's start by putting in negative four. Negative four plus four gives us zero. And so what times itself gets you zero? Zero times zero gets you zero. All right, and then we're gonna substitute in three, which is a good number because it gives us one and one times one is one. Now I don't think negative two is a good number. Let's see why it's not. Negative two plus four, that gives me something that is not square, perfectly square rootable. That gives me a decimal. We'll graph it and everything just so you can see that. But I, I'm thinking, man, I wanna try to pick values 
that'll give me perfect squares like one, four, nine, 16, et cetera, right? 25. I'd love to get those values under the radical if at all possible. So I'm kind of thinking, okay, you've already gotten one. So now I'm thinking, how can I get four? So I'm thinking, how can I get four? So what minus four will give me fours, uh, what my brain's thinking. And so maybe you can see that it would have to be eight minus four would get you four. So I'm gonna pick eight. I'm gonna try this again. I have to think now I wanna get, I've already gotten one, I've already gotten four, I wanna get nine. So I have to think what minus four would get us nine? Okay, what minus four would get us nine? So 13 minus four, you guys, is nine. So why don't we pick those values then, eight and 13? Because then when we substitute them in, we're gonna get a nice number. Okay, so this one we already said was square root of two, which is like about 1.4 if you put that into the calculator. So we're gonna graph negative two, 1.4-ish, okay? And then let's actually do the math here pretty for our notes and stuff, okay? So now we're gonna substitute in eight. Oh, it's plus four. Sorry, you guys, I wrote down minus four. Let's do that again. Then these values are not what we want. I apologize. Okay, so let me try that again. I put minus four, huh? So what plus four would get us four? Well, it'd have to be zero, right? Zero plus four would get us four. And then we wanna get nine. So what plus four will get us a nine? five plus four will get us a nine. So we want to pick five. Okay, so I'm going to do those up here. So it is zero plus four. So that gets us four, which is two, because two times two is four. And then five plus four gets us nine, which is three. So we're making our lives easy. Now, could we pick any values we want as long as they're four and up? Sure. Then you got to go and graph those and stuff. So I was just trying to pick values that would give us nice numbers, okay? All right, let's graph these. So negative four, zero. Negative four on the X, zero in the Y. Negative three in the X, one in the Y. Negative two, 1.4. Zero, two. Five, three. And so the square roots are half of the sideways parabola. We don't have the other half, you guys, okay? Um, so anytime you see a square root, think that, okay, it's gonna be half of a sideways parabola. Okay, all right. So it's actually kind of tough sometimes picking you know, what you wanna plug in for X. Okay, so we really have to think about uh, what values will make it work. Use the graph below to find each of the following function values. Now, I wanna remind you guys that we learned that f of x equals y. That's how we started off the section, f of x equals y, or talked about earlier in the section. So what they're giving you here is they're giving you the x value. x is one. What you need to find is you need to find the y value, okay? So we're going to go to where x equals 1 in the picture. So x equals 1 right there, okay? And I got to get the y value. So let's see, 1, 2, 3 is going to be the y value, okay? So f of 1 is 3. Now remember we said f of 1 equals 3 is actually the ordered pair 1, 3. And that is what this ordered pair is. That's the ordered pair 1, 3. Let me actually do that on the other side. Um, wait, I should have done it in red. You can barely see it. There we go. Okay, so now for the second one, again, f of x equals y, they're giving us x is two. So if we go to where x is two and we find the y value, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and of course you could look over here on the x-axis to get, on the y-axis to get these values, okay? So that's the ordered pair, 
two nine, right? Okay. So f of two equals nine or equals nine. Okay. These are the answers. Just want to make sure that you understand that that corresponds to the ordered pair two nine. It's the same notation. So these are super easy. They're giving you the x's, and you just need to report out what the y is. Okay. They're giving you the x. You find the y. Find the indicated function values if possible and determine whether the given values are in the domain of the function. Okay. All right. So again, this is the x value. These are, right? So these need to get substituted in for x. Okay. All right. So let's start off with getting f of 2. So I'm going to substitute in 2 for the x. And that ends up getting me 1 fifth. So f of 2 equals 1 fifth. Let's go ahead and substitute in the negative 3. Now, this is problematic because this gets us 0 in the bottom. We can't divide by 0. When we divide by 0, that's undefined. Okay. So what this means is that f of negative 3 does not exist. since it is not in the domain, okay? Um, but just as long as you know that it does not exist, we're good here, but I just want to use that. Uh, oh, it says, and determine whether the given values are in the domain. I didn't see that part. So good thing we wrote this. Negative three is not in the domain since it makes the denominator zero, but two is in the domain since it does not make the denominator zero. Now, right domain today huh two is in the domain since it does not make the denominator zero okay let's talk a little bit more about that basically if you want to find the domain you take the denominator just the denominator you guys you set it equal to zero and you solve so you're going to move the negative three or move the three over making it negative this is what x can't be. So basically, if you had a number line, right? Here's negative 3. You'd say open circle that. But any number this way is OK, and any number this way is OK. And that's why 2 is OK. Yeah. So negative 3 is not OK. So from negative infinity all the way up to negative 3, parentheses, because we don't want to include it, and then negative three to infinity. All of these numbers are the domain. These are the numbers you're allowed to plug in and they'll get an actual value out. In other words, they won't make the denominator zero. Now I'm only showing you this to preview something that we're going to do a little bit later, okay? But for now, as long as you know if it makes the denominator zero, that it um, does not exist and is not in the domain with it. All right, part B. Find the indicated function values if possible and determine whether they're in the domain or not. Okay, so we're going to substitute 9 in. So it looks like f of 9 equals 2. So that must mean that 9 was in the domain, right? 9 is in the domain. All right, let's go over here and try the other value of 4. f of 4. So we're going to substitute 4 in for x. And that gives us a negative, which means that this is imaginary. So f of 4 does not exist. Okay. And so the conclusion here is that 4 is not in the domain. Okay. Let's go look at some pictures really quickly of these last two examples so you can kind of see visually what's going on. Okay, so let me go ahead and put in 
aku deh naruh sebelah coba all right so the first one was one divided by x plus three right and as you recall in this last slide no i'm sorry i really pushed back we said two was okay two got us one fifth well, if you go to where two is, it does look like we went up one fifth or 0.20, okay? All right, but the next one was negative three. If you look at X equals negative three, there is a big emptiness in the graph here, right? And so that's why that is not part of the domain and why we get does not exist, okay? Let's try the next one, which was the uh, square root of, is it X minus four, you guys? X minus five. Okay, so here's what the graph looks like. The values that we were supposed to find were F of nine, right? So when X is nine. Well, when X is nine, we do have a value and it looks like it's two, right? We went up two. So that's what we had. We had F of nine equals two. Then the next one that we were supposed to get was F of four and we said, well, it does not exist. Well, if you go to where x equals four right here, there is no graph anywhere. So that makes sense to say it does not exist there, okay? All right, it's nice to have that visual that goes with uh, what we were learning. All right, you guys, that is the end of part one uh, for one, two. Take care.